We've now seen a way of calculating this optimal bundle once you're given a utility function that represents the underlying indifference map for this consumer. The advantage of that way of doing it was that we didn't have to use any multivariable calculus. You simply had to take a single variable derivative. But there is a more general way of solving optimization problems that's useful in many applications in economics. And that's called the Lagrange method. Now we're not going to go into exactly why that method works. But you're going to see the intuition from just what we did in the previous way of doing it. Previously we said we had to set a derivative to zero because on the top of a hill the derivative is zero. And you're going to see in this method we're also going to set derivatives equal to zero for the same reason. But the method starts by creating a new function that's called the Lagrange function. And it's typically denoted by this capital script L. That function has two components. The first one is simply what we're trying to maximize. Here we're trying to maximize utility. And in this example, utility is given by x1 times x2. So the first part is what we're trying to maximize, which is x1 times x2 in our example. The second part is preceded by a Greek letter lambda, which is called the Lagrange multiplier. And it's followed by the constraint, but the constraint with all the terms collected on one side of the equation. So 500 minus 50 x1 minus 25 x2. So we've just taken these two terms and subtracted them, collected them on one side, so the equation is then equal to zero, and we've taken that part and put it in here. That's it. That's the Lagrange function, the thing you're trying to optimize plus lambda times your constraint. The next thing we do is we take some partial derivatives, three of them. First, the partial of L with respect to x1, the second, the partial of L with respect to x2, and the third, the partial of L with respect to lambda. So let's do that. The partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to x1 is going to give us an x2 in the first term. I'm sorry, an x2. Why? Because the x2 is not something we're differentiating with respect to, so we're just going to leave it alone. And we take the derivative with respect to x1. The derivative of x1 with respect to x1 is just equal to 1. Then we're going to get a second term, which comes from this term, because there is another x1. So if you multiply this out, you'd get 500 lambda minus 50 times x1 lambda minus 25 times x2 lambda. That's just multiplying this out. So you have two terms where there is no x1. So when we differentiate those, they just go away. So all we have to worry about is this middle term, the lambda times minus 50 x1. When we differentiate that with respect to, lamb to x1, we just get 50 lambda. So we keep the minus sign, minus 50 lambda. If we take the partial derivative with, derivative with respect to x2, we take the derivative of the first term, since we're differentiating with respect to x2, we leave the x1 alone, and the derivative of x2 with respect to x2 is just equal to 1. Then we have to worry about this term, where there is an x2. The derivative of that with respect to x2 is just minus 25 lambda. And finally, differentiating with respect to lambda, well, that's just this. So that's just the budget constraint. Minus 25 x2. So we have our three partial derivatives. And we're going to set those to zero. Again, for the exact same reason we set the derivative equal to zero in the previous way of doing it. 
it's the same underlying intuition. So that's set to zero, that's set to zero, and that's set to zero. So now we have three equations and three unknowns. The three unknowns are x1, x2, and lambda. Since we don't really care about the lambda, we're just going to get rid of it first. So we're going to take these first two equations and rewrite them. Take the negative term to the other side. So this becomes x2 is equal to 50 lambda. We'll do the same thing with the second equation, x1 is equal to 25 lambda. Now we can divide these equations by each other. So we'll get x2 divided by x1 is equal to 50 divided by 25. The lambdas are just going to cancel. And 50 divided, so it's equal to 50 divided by 25, which is just equal to 2. Then we can just take the x1 to the other side and say, well, x2 is going to be twice x1. We can already see us moving to this solution. x2 turns out to be twice of x1. Finally, we can take this equation, which is just the budget equation, and substitute the x2 in here so that we get an equation of just one variable just the x1. So we'll get 500 minus 50 times x1 minus 2 times x1 times 25. Actually, let me write this. 25 times 2 x1. So we see exactly where it came from. And that's equal to zero. So in other words, 500 minus 50x1 minus 50x1 is minus 100x1 is equal to zero. Or 100x1 is equal to 500. Just taking that term to the other side. Which means x1 is equal to 5. Exactly what we got with our previous method. And since we know that x2 is twice of x1, we can now know that x2 is equal to 10. We're just using this. And that's exactly what we also got previously. So that's how the Lagrange method works. Now there's one other thing I'd like to point out. Look at what we got in this step. We got x2 over x1 is equal to 50 divided by 25. 50 divided by 25 is p1 over p2. So that's equal to p1 over p2. And when we first derived the marginal rate of substitution mathematically, we used this function and calculated that the marginal rate of substitution for this function was equal to minus x2 over x1. So what we have here is x2 over x1, which is minus the marginal rate of substitution. So the equation says minus the marginal rate of substitution is equal to pri the price of good 1 divided by the price of good 2, which is the same as saying that the marginal rate of substitution is equal to minus p1 over p2. Exactly the condition we need at the optimal bundle. So as you're solving this Lagrange problem, you're actually getting at some point to the place where it says the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the ratio of the prices. You use that to figure out this, and then you use the budget constraint to find the final answer.